Hello, everybody. Welcome to the event. My name is Paul. I'm the CTO and co-founder of LatticeFlow. Uh, technical background, I did my PhD at ETH, um, working on the topics robustness and trustworthiness. And this is kind of how we started LatticeFlow. And this is kind of our mission of the company to really empower companies, to enable them to build trustworthy, high performance and, and robust uh, AI systems. And it's not just me, there is two other professors or co-founders of the company and been really working on this topic for the last five, six, seven, eight years, and really now trying to bring it from the research to the industry and to the practice. And when we talk about robustness and trustworthiness, we typically work, think about three pillars. And the three pillars, when you kind of develop these kind of models is on one hand, you have the data. And here, it's all about kind of diagnosing and improving your data. On the second part, you have models where it's all about kind of figuring out is there some hidden uh, issues in the model or what we call blind spots, essentially, when the model is systematic, systematically making mistakes, but you actually don't know because it's kind of hidden because you have millions of millions of examples and uh, essentially you don't know about it, all the way to essentially regulatory part where you want to formally reason about the models and what we do technically is really the technical part of the regulations where someone actually has to check that the model is doing the right thing, not just write on paper or essentially what is the process, which is extremely important, but essentially it's, it's always two sides. On one hand is the process, on the other one is the technical part. And what better way to show you than, than with an example. And uh, one of the reasons that we are all here is, is essentially uh, because of this. So, there is a huge potential of AI, and this is what all the companies kind of figured out, which really re revolutionized how many of the products are built. And this is really because these systems are essentially reaching or even outperforming human performance. So there is a clear value here. But at the same time, there are some issues. And what are the issues? Well, I will show you kind of one short clip of one a uh, race of autonomous cars. So these are essentially competition of cars that are driving autonomously. And this is what happened in the second round. So this is kind of an illustration of what happens in the real world. And, and this is an event where clearly people spend incredible amount of time, effort and money to make this work. And yet this happens. And the main problem with this is that this is very visual. Like the car literally crashed into the wall and they probably had to spend half a year to build a new one. In many real world AI systems, the, the AI system is not crashing into the wall, which is the problem because the things are not so visible like in this case. And that's kind of the problem of this hidden problem and kind of hidden issues of the model that are not so, uh, easy to, to figure out. And this is also one of the problems that even though there is huge potential and huge value in the systems, actually, if you look at the statistics, roughly 80, 90% of these projects actually fail. And, and this is kind of one of the, the problem where on one hand, there is a huge potential, but on the other hand, there is kind of struggle translating this potential into the practice in many of the, the cases. So, how can we essentially take this example and, and put it in the practice? And this is, for example, what we did uh, last month when we presented at ECR. This is the biggest radiology conference in the Europe with more than 20,000 attendees in Vienna. And, and what happens, so this is radiology conference. So these are mostly doctors that spend their days kind of looking at images like this, where they have an X-ray in this case of a chest. And they will try to figure out essentially, is there anything wrong with the patient? And what happened in the last few years is that kind of in addition to all these doctors, there are now companies building AI models trying to do the same thing, right? So the model will take exactly the same picture as the doctor, and but we'll look at it from different eyes, essentially from the eyes of the machine learning, trying to come up with the, the same diagnosis to, this is not to replace the doctor, this is to complement the doctor. 
what we do at lattice flow is, is essentially this part here. Are these models actually performing well uh, and as, as they essentially claim? And this is the part here is that if the model is not performing well, you will not see a car crashing into the, into the wall. You will have a patient with a bad diagnosis. And this is the kind of the problem in this case. And, and when we talk about are these models really performing well, we talk about it both from the practical perspective as well as really certifying these models where we, for example, won the first competition in the world in, back in 2020 about formally certifying that these models are doing the right thing. And what is the challenge in this case? Well, one of the challenge here is that when you're training these models, essentially the way it works, you collect lots of lots of data. So we'll, you will go to the hospital, you will look at the last 10 years of all the patient records, kind of what is the diagnosis, and this is what you would feed into the model. And the problem is that all these data can have hidden biases or hidden problems, even if it's correctly labeled. And this is kind of what will be then potentially picked up by the AI model because the AI model doesn't know about biases and doesn't know about all these things. And in this particular case, one of the biases can actually be the fact that there is a treatment made to the patient that is kind of visible in the image. So this is kind of what is highlighted here. And now the question is, well, is this something that is used by the model? And if yes, this is clearly wrong. Like we should not be diagnosing patient based on the treatment, right? This is a consequence of, of something uh, of, of the disease. So really what you have in this case is this what if question, like what if this treatment was not there? Would the model still work as expected? And one way to check this, I don't know if you see it too well, is literally remove the treatment from the picture. So if I go back here, you can kind of see a bit the treatment. If I go here, now the treatment is removed. Now this is essentially some synthetic transformation of the image that is removing and, and essentially replacing parts of the image with something else. And now we can, with these two images, ask the system again and check essentially, do you still think uh, that the patient has some sort of disease? And if now the system says no, clearly there is a mismatch. So either this is really relevant for figuring out and could be that this is essentially medical condition that is relevant or could just be that this is this hidden bias of the model and actually this has to be fixed and reported back to the developers. And naturally the question here is, okay, now we had an idea of what it is, but in general, you just don't know. There are like many, many other hidden things in the model. And this is where we need systems to help developers as well as users to automate this process. And to kind of see it, how it kind of lo looks uh, from the machine learning perspective is typically people have this nice idea of, I just go, I collect a lot of data, I will label it, I will train my model, I will evaluate and I will deploy. But this is kind of the nice workflow that, that people may be in academia talk or if people are working in the lab or you are kind of trying out a small model, this is what you would do. But in practice, what happens is once you deploy, you will kind of, maybe you go to sleep and you start thinking about, well, do I really know if the model is working well? Maybe you will start kind of digging a bit more, looking at the predictions, trying to check if it's really doing the right thing. And maybe you didn't find anything, but at some point the user comes in the, in the good case um, that is angry because the user figured out that something is not working well. And this is already essentially a problem because sometimes the user doesn't come and again, like the patient would have a bad uh, diagnosis. And then if this happens, typically this expensive process of you go back to the product team, you start in investigating why is this the issue. Maybe after some time you come up with the hypothesis that, oh, maybe I think that the issue is in the model because there is this particular type of the bias. Now, the problem is that this is one of the explanations and maybe the problem is actually in the data because maybe we switched a new device, maybe the software got updated or there is some other shift uh, that happened to the data. And the problem is that the machine learning thing will essentially have all these hypotheses of what can go wrong, but not really a good way to check which one it is. So essentially they would start doing this kind of way up types of analysis, trying to figure out whether this is, and this again takes time, this takes money. And after some time they will figure out, okay, maybe I had the right guess, maybe I fixed it and then I'll try to deploy it. But ultimately I get back into the same problem because I'm just fixing some errors that were reported me rather than doing this systematically. So the bad news is that this is where many of the teams end up. And this is why many of these projects fail. The good thing is that we can actually help them. 
So, um, and it's also important from the regulatory perspective where, especially when we talk about data and the labeling, this is actually excerpt from the latest proposal of the EU regulations that is, for example, talking about that the data set should be relevant, representative, free of errors and complete. And this is now very nice thing to say from the regulatory perspective. And I would say everybody would like to have this. Again, the main thing is how do we actually achieve this in practice where, for example, even doctors cannot agree what does, for example, the correct label could be in some of the cases. So, so this is kind of nice thing to have, but we need a technical way how to, to get it. So I kind of told you at the beginning that there are these three pillars. So if you kind of look at them back now again, so if you look at the data, what we would really like to have is some way to help teams and users to automatically pick up problems in the data and kind of propose them before the system is deployed such that we can fix them. And, and this actually has a huge impact. And then you probably heard about all this data -cent centric movement where it's all about the data, less about the model. And this is kind of one statistics that kind of proves it with these kind of three lines in the, in the below. So essentially here, the higher, the better. And the three lines below are kind of optimizing different model architectures. The one line above is about what happens if you actually clean up the data in a proper way. And this is just one example. Um, when we look at the model, this is all these hidden kind of biases, spurious correlations, or, or things that the model is picking up to essentially still make even correct prediction. And this is why this can be dangerous. Like the model actually can be making correct predictions and it might look like it's doing better than human, but actually it's not. And again, you would want to have a way how you can find this before these models are deployed all the way to kind of regulatory. And, and to make it a bit concrete, let's look at two more examples on the model side. So in this case, we'll kind of move on from the medical to essentially car damage detection that is used very hev heavily with uh, car insurance companies or in general insurance companies, where kind of the problem is we have a lot of images of cars, for example, people taking with their phones, essentially pictures around the car and sending it to the insurance company. And goal of the system is to predict, is there a damage or is there not a damage? And again, the main problem with the systems is that the way we would typically kind of evaluate them and decide whether the system is good is kind of looking at the aggregate accuracy of the system. Like, oh, the system has 98% accuracy, meaning it's good in, for nine out of 10 examples. But in practice, what actually can happen is the following. So um, if you kind of look at some of the examples in the data, again, you can see that the way people, for example, take pictures, if there is a damage, is that, for example, they start pointing at the damage. And it's a very natural thing for people to do, uh, or they even would open a Photoshop and start circling things uh, <laughs> to kind of point uh, to whoever is looking at the picture. And again, this is kind of hidden bias in the data that the model learns and it will learn to for example essentially this detect fingers in the image rather than the, the the actual fault and it's exactly the same problem as we've seen in the medical and it's exactly the problem is that not all the images and not all the damages have fingers like this may be one percent of your data this may be half percent of your data but it's there and the model can and might pick it up and your question is is this actually happening and can i figure it out in the same way Another type of bias might be, again, kind of very kind of human-like, where if there is a damage, not only I put the finger, but maybe I zoom a bit to kind of show it in a better way. Again, this is another hypothesis that I might have, and I would like to have a system that can very easily check whether this is a problem or not. Uh, so again, in this case, if I actually go and check it, I will again figure out that actually it is a problem. It's something that the model picked up and is biased and is affecting the predictions. The main part here would again be how can you do this in minutes rather than now going labeling half of my data set if it's a close-up is it something further away because this is what takes time in the same way so this is on the regulatory side but this is typically later on so essentially um, I mean depends like now there is lots of regulations coming in maybe the one that I showed you would actually be approved next year and then this would not be later on this would be like <laughs> you have to already do it uh, but the way I look at it, and then we will have a panel discussion later on, is that this is kind of 
people up front are trying to formalize some set of good practices, hopefully, that the company should follow. But in ideal world, these are good practices that the company is already following because this is something that helps them build models that are better, more trustworthy. So this is kind of just trying to prevent companies potentially being lazy and not doing these things uh, in a formal way. And we've seen it in many, many other areas, such as in medicine, where there are very strict FDA approvals for getting these things to the market, which is very good ultimately for the consumers. It's all about the level of what is the balance between being good for consumers and kind of being restrictive in terms of the market. And maybe lastly, if you look at data, again, it's all about how can we quickly find issues and kind of fix them. In this case, we can look at another domain for worker safety where we're literally trying to predict is the person wearing a helmet or is the person not wearing a helmet? And if the person is not wearing a helmet, someone has to run and kind of kick him and say, hey, like this is not safe. And one of the problems here can be that when we look at the data itself, for example, you will start noticing that we have images like this, where there is a person that is kind of wearing a helmet, but it's cut off. So you can see it a bit in the top left corner, but essentially we should either remove this image from the data or we should adjust the, the cropping such that the helmet is properly uh, included. And the main challenge here is that you might see one image like this, but ideally you want to go now go through all your data set, find all the images in the same issue and essentially bulk change the, the annotation or bulk remove them. And this is again, from the technical side, what, what you would like a system that actually helps you automate this process achieve. So we would go from one image to all the similar images uh, with a similar issue in your data set and you can quickly fix it. Okay, so this is roughly uh, what we are working on, um, really ranging from the data to the model all the way to the regulators, uh, supporting the full life cycle of companies. And I'll be happy to take more questions if you have some. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. So, yes, what I immediately think of now is, is what about the actual mitigations of, of this uh, of this problem. So I guess that the most common production feedback that one can get is about like, yeah, we found this blind spot in the model. This doesn't work when there is a lung drain or if a red car. So what, what do you do in these cases? What's the typical practice? Do you add this to the training data and then restart the development process from, uh, yes, whatever you can tell about this, I'm interested. Yes, this is very common. So, and this kind of goes in line with the data centric view where essentially most of the fixing is not in the model. Most of the fixing is, I should add more examples in the data. The main thing is what examples should I be adding? So if I just add examples at random, I'm not going to fix this problem. So I have to be very targeted in, in what it is. There are other ways where you can actually look at the model as well. And we have a lot of work about reasoning about the internals of the model. And for example, figuring out which part of the model is actually responsible for this mistake. And for example, almost like turning it off and you can do it then without retraining, which is also much more efficient, uh, especially for big models and big companies that spend like two weeks retraining the model. And then you can essentially avoid this as well. Do you have experience with this car accident? How long is it from the accident until the case is closed? Um, this is not something we do. So we are working with car insurance companies that would have this workflow what we do is help them essentially build these systems. Okay. So this is kind of on the side of the health insurance company. But one of the advantages and one of the values of these kind of AI models is that you can actually do this literally in minutes because you can send the picture, it gets to the insurance company. There is an algorithm like this that runs and figures out what is the damage or not. It can immediately estimate the damage and it can already send you essentially a repair bill. And then only if this gets wrong, there is a human that actually goes and checks it. Mm -hmm. so, so this can really get into minutes if done properly. Yes, I know the Chinese company are very, um, if you have there an accident, you send a photo and one hour late, you have the money on your bank account. Exactly, exactly. This is kind of the level where some of the best insurance companies can actually get it mm. to. Yes. Thank you. Sorry, I, I walked halfway into your presentation. Um, I think it's awesome that you mentioned the uh, regulatory perspective because I think it needs more people like Lattice Flow to be um, talking about these things. Um, it's one thing to have regulators talking about this, like you said, but then it's people like you. Um, 
turns out that regulators, they actually care less about sort of the specific data and model properties and really look at this almost like very traditionally at a system level and system level properties. So how do you see sort of the link from data and model to, to the regulatory side? I think that's where we have to do still a lot of work also in terms of like communicating some of these aspects with people that have maybe not like a machine learning or an AI background more generally. Yes. And I think, I mean, this is, this is, this makes sense because the regulation should not be about how you do things, right? The regulation should be about what should be done and then how is kind of free to everybody to implement the best way possible. Um, the problem is that people in many of these cases still don't know how to do it. And that's then the problem of like, how can you have a regulation if you don't know how to implement it? Right. Uh, so, um, when you collect data, like if you take all the data that you collected, uh, when uh, you have some uh, kind of reasoning that uh, the distribution is the same as you will encounter in the wild, right? But uh, if you start then uh, tweaking it, like right, you say that, okay, I'll remove all these images with fingers, I don't know, mm -hmm. right? Or something like that. Then uh, you essentially introduce a domain shift. So, that weakens overall uh, argument to the regulator that the system will perform in the wild. So how do you, what is your answer to it? <laughs> That's a good question. So, I mean, and it, it also connects to the previous question. So when you talk about regulations, and again, we will have a panel, uh, the first thing you need to do is specify what is, what is the system actually supposed to do and what are the essentially like in automotive, it's called almost like ODD, like what is the domain that where the system is supposed to be working well. And in this particular domain, then you can start reasoning about is the system actually working. So in this case, the task would be our system is supposed to not to work where people are putting fingers and then we are restricting it. Of course, then you can have other mechanisms saying, how can I automatically detect if there are fingers in the image? Because maybe users are not follow, following kind of the requirements of the system. So you essentially want to have it robust to uh, the user input as well. Thank you. Uh, I mean, you made very clear example on how these data set biases are uh, present in this kind of image recognition problems. You're like, <laughs> my company works with kind of uh, time series data sets. Do you have any examples of problems and issues? And have you dealt with some experience? Have you have any, do you have any experience with similar issues that can arise with time series in this sense? Um, yes, and actually Raphael <laughs> here in the audience is a student who did his master thesis with us. And, and he literally has a paper on time series predictions and how some of these models arise there. And I mean, like what kind of problems in the data set were you experiencing, for example? Uh, can you, can you? Yeah. I mean, Paul didn't say that he has a lot of experience with adversarial settings where we just, just uh, imagine that uh, a setting where an attacker is trying to actually uh, corrupt your data and then do modification. So I guess that would be in one of the settings. And actually still works in a time series in a handwriting uh, recognition. And uh, yes, I mean, I don't know if you had that in mind because I think it's a particular application. Yeah, and thanks for the presentation. I had one question. Uh, you have shown different examples from different domains uh, and are there supposed to be different metrics of the quality of the performance of the actual solution depending on the domain? And are you developing specific metrics for each case or are you using some universal approaches? I would say it's both. So we have a set of metrics that we believe are good depending on the domain. But at the same time, if you talk with companies, they will also have their own set of metrics. And this can be typically like even four or five different metrics that are looking at different aspects of the system. So you essentially want to have both and you want to be flexible in both ways. Okay, thank you.